I really, really firmly believe that if you treat people right and you do right and you go the extra mile, good things come of that. And that you can get caught up in saving a dime and end up losing your arm you know, mm. uh, because of because of how you treated people. Welcome to It's Settled, the Amitros podcast. Each episode, we're going to dig into the humanity in workers' compensation and insurance claims, exploring the stories of injured people and those who support them, as well as the good work professionals are doing in the industry. And now, I invite you to join me, Sean Dean, General Counsel at Amitros and the host of It's Settled. Now, It's Settled. Let's get on to the episode. Greg Hamlin, and the the tales have turned, I guess, where you go from podcast host to podcast guest. So probably a little bit of a different dynamic for you, but I'm sure is equally as uh, exciting and and fun for you. So welcome, Greg. Really, really nice to have you. Appreciate your time today. Thanks, Sean. Glad to be here. Uh, It's going to be a nice break to not have to be the one thinking of all the questions. So. For those who don't know me, I'm the Senior Vice President of Claims for Berkeley Industrial Comp, and I also do a workers' comp podcast called Adjusted. And everyone in the industry loves it, and, and so do I. I I'm, I'm a total fanboy of yours, so it's uh, it's like my first celebrity guest uh, on here. <laughs> um, we were talking right before we came on. I, I had a I had a, a long flight, but I, I don't I don't have you beat on the um, energy front because you have you have six kids so i'm sipping green tea while for for the viewers at home they can't see uh greg has some exotic monster drink happening with <laughs> That's exactly right. Right. Uh, i can't you know so my oldest is 17 i've got a daughter that's a junior she's about to be a senior and then i have kids all the way down to uh three months old so my sleep sleep is a valuable thing and there's a lot of caffeine in my diet unfortunately that's amazing. I don't know how you have time to do it. So for, for folks who may not know you, um, tell us a little bit about your background and how uh, you came into the comp world. Most of the folks I talk to, and, and, and I would love for the script to be flipped, flipped a little bit, but most people I talk to say that comp found them that they didn't find comp and, and someday, hopefully, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now, we, we can, find that the, the next generation of folks, you know, they, they, um, where they sought out comp, but, uh, how did you get involved in the industry? So I, I would love to say that in first grade for my show and tell, I dressed up like an insurance guy, but I did not. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, I, um, actually, so I worked for Indiana university while I was going to school there doing non for profit fundraising and really, really enjoyed that. What I, what I loved about it is I always felt like I was able to make a difference because I knew I was raising money for scholarships so that people could get an education. And uh, I believe that when you become educated or further your education, you're able to further yourself and help other people. And so I absolutely love that. I did it for four years, all the way through school, uh, running a call center eventually. And uh, during that time, I met my wife and we got married and we actually had a baby while um, I was a senior in college. And so if you can imagine, um, you know, trying to have a young family while you're both students, we obviously knew we needed to like figure out the next thing. And so I sat down with the director of the, of the IU foundation to talk about like, well, what would be my path here? And he's like, Greg, you've already got a baby, man. Uh, you know, are you going to have more? And I, and I said, my wife, uh, jokingly says she wants 10 and he said, you need to get out of here. <laughs> so, so he said, take the same skills you've got and go to the career fair, find some business and uh, get engaged in that. And so that's exactly what I did. I went to a career fair at Indiana University, uh, found Liberty Mutual. They trained me. And I found what I found in comp that I loved in uh, fundraising was, again, I felt like I was making a difference. Uh, And uh, you're helping people, which is really what we do. So what was your career trajectory from then? Were you claims handler? How did you sort of wind your way yeah, so I started out in national market workers' compensation, 
uh, doing uh, really large accounts. Like at that time, it was uh, Northwest Airlines and Sears and then later UPS. Uh, so these were big, huge accounts, uh, very demanding. And um, I did that for about six years and then took a promotion and moved my family to Cincinnati, uh, where I was a supervisor of a team at Ohio Casually. Liberty had bought them. And so I went there, built out their team there and um, did some commercial liability too, which was a, which was a big change. And then had the opportunity to go uh, run the state fund in Kentucky's claims program, uh, Kimi. So that was, uh, I felt like each of those steps were huge growing experiences for me and uh, new challenges in each place. And uh, now I've, I've been with Berkeley Industrial Comp for almost four years now. So, wow. Cool. So I talked to a lot of folks in the comp industry and <clears throat> there is sort of a, I had this conversation specifically with Kristen Chavez um, last podcast, and unfortunately, there's it seems to be there's sort of a pervasive overarching perception that at least from the public and men, and, and frankly, it's seeped into pop culture that workers' compensation is viewed in sort of two negative lights. It's either there is a an employee who's trying to game the system. And they're trying to not work and just get, you know, a free ride. Or there's an employer, um, the, the employer carrier side is just trying to deny benefits, trying to give someone a hard time, make it incredibly adversarial. And as, as we progress as, as an industry, and, and as if you work in the industry, we know, well, frankly, that's, that's just not true. But there's been an increase in empathy and wanting to to um, emphasize taking care of an injured individual and that's often what we talk about uh, on the podcast especially when we highlight um, injured individuals and their their journey um, I'd be curious to know like if I mean if if you agree with that sentiment that that's sort of the, at least the outside world's perception and how you've seen that because you've been in, in the comp world for so long, how you've seen that change um, and maybe some things that are going on right now where there's more of an emphasis on this, this empathetic model of claims handling and resolution. Well, so, so I certainly would agree with you on um... I think there's perception and some of that's real. Uh, some of that we've created for ourselves right. uh, in that, um, you know, obviously we're not, not maybe all, all the state funds, but for sure the, the insurance companies, you know, we are for profit um, and having come from non-for-profit, those are different types of ways of looking at things. But I don't think that they, I don't think that they have to live in separate worlds. And I think that's, I guess, where maybe my mindset's a little different. Maybe that has something to do with the background that I've come up through. But I really, really firmly believe that if you treat people right and you do right and you go the extra mile, good things come of that. And that you can get caught up in saving a dime and end up losing your arm you know, mm -hmm. uh, because, of, because of how you treated people. And a perfect example, and I'm comfortable sharing this one because, uh, you know, the when I was at the state fund, we took over a bunch of claims that were from a group fund that went under. So they don't even exist anymore. But the claims handlers at the time, when we took these claims, one of these claims, they had a, a compound cream, which, you know, they mixed a bunch of things together, put it in a cream. Usually they're medicine, medications that can be taken orally. You would put it on a body part. And they're awfully, awfully expensive. And there's very little clinical data to show that they're helpful. So obviously our goal is to do right, try to find the right solutions for the person. And so I had worked with the adjuster to reach out and let's understand what the needs are and let's find out if it's helping them and all of these kinds of things. And this injured worker said, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, when I had my injury, the, this medication was denied. I fought to get it approved. I'm not even using it. I've got a closet full of these things and I'm going to each month fill it and each month put it in my closet just to, just to stick it to you because of how badly you treated me. Now it wasn't our company, right? We took these over from somebody else, but sure. it was really clear to me 
that we had created, not we, but the insurance industry for this individual had created a situation where she was totally ticked off and ready to prove to the world that she was going to get hers. And I think it's really hard when we create those kinds of relationships to get good outcomes. And it ends up costing everybody a whole lot more money. So I think we start with empathy. We start with listening. We start with slowing down. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean, I think the other problem is I think people, there's a perception of, well, if I'm nice or if I'm listening and caring, then that also means that I'm a pushover. And, you know, again, being a, a dad of six kids, you know, if every time they did something wrong, I took their phone away and grounded them and did whatever other mean things I could think of to punish them, we wouldn't get very far. And of course, there are times that it's like, you got to be serious about stuff, but um, you have to build relationships of trust and it's important. Yeah, for sure. What, what about the ways you've seen um, how we as, as a claims industry interface with injured individuals because it's, I mean, comp is a, is a statutory creature. Yep. That's different in all 50 states. That's often presented in, um, and, and I'm, I'm a lawyer by background, and, and I've seen a lot of communication from claims handlers to injured individuals. And it's, it's very formalized and it's very boilerplate and, and oftentimes complicated. To, to digest for a layperson, have have you seen things change in that arena too? Because I'm just thinking about the the empathetic sort of resolution model that seems to be adopted. Like, not only is it in the way we have a conversation with an individual, but it's also the way we engage them, and oftentimes it's in writing. Yeah, it's and and I think we have to remember. For most of our injured workers, they have not been through something like this before. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of them do not have college educations, at least a lot of the ones we we, we insure often are blue-collar workers, hard workers, um, smart guys. But, you know, the, it, before I got into workers' compensation, all of these statutes, statutes were confusing to me. So if you can imagine somebody who has had no experience to it with it, that's really frustrating. And um, so one of the things we did, and this was actually one of the uh, adjusters on my team suggested this is let's take a look at our letters and our communications and let's rewrite them. Let's start with empathy and then let's explain the process as best as we possibly can so that they understand our goal is to get you the benefits that you're entitled to. That's our goal. And to do that, we need cooperation on these on these pieces. And so we make sure we tell them right from the start, um, one, that we understand that they were hurt, that we understand it's frustrating, and then, then we walk through. So we want to make sure that you're getting your checks timely. To get that, we need your work status. So if you can help us with that and provide that, that will ensure that we get your benefits to you timely. So we go through each of these things, whether it's direct deposit, so you don't have to wait on a check. Um, you know, I think... What I keep doing with my adjusters is saying, okay, put yourself in their shoes and imagine you didn't get the check. Like, imagine if we get paid Friday, if we were getting paid today, and it didn't show up. There's not a lot of people who wouldn't be upset. Right. So, you know, I don't think that those are hard things to think about, but somehow when you're doing it every day, we can kind of almost become callous to the fact that these people have families and lives and they're trying to take care of those things. Um, and most people uh, are really trying to do the right thing. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, we're, it seems like we've already landed on the theme of empathy and, and helping people. And, and I think um, that is really critical to, uh, well, hopefully it's critical to all generations, but it seems to be especially important to um, the younger generations as they come up and are selecting their career career paths. It seems like altruism is just big and important to them. And I'm, I'm so thankful for that. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm uh, four kids uh, less than you, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. And I hope my children select career paths that where they are driven by a desire to make a difference in people's lives. And unfortunately, I think the other 
misperception about um, the industry is that it's someone in a business casual drab attire in a, <laughs> a uh, dimly lit uh, room with it's artificially lighted it at it, an old metal desk, you know, with a antiquated computer with a cathode ray tube <laughs> monitor and just typing away. And it's just purely administrative. And I, I think if, if that perception is held by a younger generation, they're probably not going to want to try to explore careers uh, in insurance. Cause I mean, you jokingly said at the beginning, like, you know, someone came in and did a career day. And you know, if you probably guessed how they dress, they probably, you know, they probably look like how I described it. So like, what, what do you think are, are some ways to um, change that perception within the existing uh, team structure we have with, with younger adjusters? Um, I mean, how do you, how do you sort of get them out of that? Um, I don't know if, if rut's the best word, but just change, change the model there. That's a great question. I, I think we have to start with understand. We have to do a better job of clarifying what our why is, because I don't mm -hmm. think we do a very good job of that. So if we tell kids that are coming out of college that your why is to create ROE, think about that. That's not really a driver for somebody out of college. Okay. So if that's the why, yeah. right, then we're going to have a hard time, one, getting them engaged, two, retaining them. Um, now, like going back to my example uh, at the university, my why every day was I knew no matter how hard it got, I was trying to raise money so that somebody could get an education. And then with that education, hopefully their life would change. So that was a great why. So every day when I woke up, I knew what I was doing, why I was doing it. And when it got hard, I knew why I was going to push through the hard parts. So with our adjusters, I think we need to start there and go back and say, well, why do we exist? And what are they doing to move that forward? And I think if you explain that your why is to help people get back to get back, get healed, get back to work, get back to being able to do and have the things in their life that are important to them, uh, provide uh, safety and security for their employer so that they can keep their job moving forward. Um, I think those are easier things to relate to. So we've got to go back and look at that a little bit, I think. Um, and again, going, I think there's been a, a fear to do that because, well, if we do that, then that's going to cost a whole lot of money. And it, and it really doesn't cost a lot of money to care about people, um, cost time. So that means we probably need to think about slow, lower case loads. Uh, and I guess that could cost, cost some, uh, some money, but I believe firmly that if you have the time to do the right thing, you're going to get better outcomes anyway. And those decisions are going to lead to, you know, it might be hard to quantify, but thousands of dollars that are going to be saved because we're doing the right thing. Um, Can so, you talk a little bit about the the creation of the the, the business engagement team? Um, absolutely, absolutely. So this this is something that um, I've been experimenting with for a while. That back in 2019, we changed our approach to how we uh, handled what I guess would typically be called admin work, uh, and and the reason for that is I believe, and I still believe that one of the things computers and systems do great, analytics do great, is uh, data entry, you know, those types of things where, uh, you know, you populate something into a form. Uh, those types of jobs in our lifetime are, are likely to be gone uh, when you start to think about text to voice ability and all the cool things that are being worked on. Uh, but what what computers don't do well is build relationships with people. Um, you know, maybe people have, some people probably are in relationships with their phones, but <laughs> for, the, for the most part, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, people crave human interaction. And I think we really saw that during COVID uh, as people were isolated, is how much we missed each other, how yep. much, much we missed human interaction. And so what we decided to do is, let's open that up and let's use interns or people. So people, some of our students are in college right now while they're working. Uh, some of them go to school at night. Some of them are working 25 hours a week in between classes. Um, so we're getting exposure to the current college population right now in this customer experience. And 
Yes, today they're still filling something out. There are still some Freud's where they're filling boxes out. There's some new business on the underwriting side that they're filling things out. And that's probably going to be the case for a while um, as technology continues to kind of catch up with where we need to head. But what it's doing is getting exposure to them, to the insurance industry on both the claims and underwriting side. And uh, then we've also brought in people with customer service backgrounds. Maybe they haven't finished their degree. Maybe they're 38 and they're an amazing flight attendant or they're an amazing uh, bed, bath and beyond customer service person. Uh, we've hired somebody from Publix. Uh, so maybe they have more maturity than maybe a college student would have and maybe a little less education, but they have experience with dealing with people who are upset or dealing with difficult conversations. And I think that mix together has worked really well for us. Uh, we've had people promoted in the last three years since we've created it in both underwriting claims and finance. Uh, and what we've seen is the people in that unit really enjoy having the exposure to all the different parts of, of what makes an insurance company work. Uh, and we don't see it as a place where you live. We see it as a place that you learn, you gain experience, and then you kind of advance to the place that you feel uh, you gravitate towards. So I think it's a really innovative way to look at how we think about the future. Uh, and I'm excited about where it's heading. Time will tell, I guess, over the next few years, uh, if it continues to, to do what we're hoping. I think it also, that's amazing. And I think it also allows for different career pathing for someone too. Because when, when you mention to someone, Hey, have you thought about a career in insurance or have you thought about a career in workers' compensation? They think, okay, I'm going to be a desk level adjuster. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I work with incredible desk level adjusters, um, uh, folks who've only been on the job a year, folks who've been doing it for, for 20 years and are getting ready to phase out. Um, and, and they sort of, you know, they, they keep the lights on uh, and they keep, they keep the claims process going. But you, know, you mentioned it too, like underwriting, marketing, um, uh, management roles, uh, even on the medical side or the legal side, like there, there's a, a huge variety of potential options for someone to plug themselves into in the claims world where it's not just, they're not just going to be at a desk with a caseload of 300 and having to, to you know, just slog away at that. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's a more dynamic industry than uh, people think. I know a lot of really creative people on the marketing side. Um, yep. We're doing really incredible things. I mean, you, you and I, well, I'm more on the periphery, uh, but you I mean, you have a podcast. Uh, right, right. You know? And you know, the guy, the uh, person who edits our podcast actually is going to school right now. He's, he's, he is taking classes at night. Uh, he started as an intern for us. And then now he is a full-time employee and just continuing his studies at night. But like he went through that business engagement program that we're talking about and he's the guy who learned how to edit and is doing that. So we didn't go to market and go hire an editor. We just looked him internally and said, Hey, this guy's really good at uh, computers and he's smart. This would be fun for him to do something different. So um, I think we need to be more open-minded about getting people experiences. And so speaking of the podcast, what was the impetus behind that? Well, you know, one day where you just, uh, <laughs> hey, I want a podcast. <laughs> no, well, uh, I am a nerd and I listen to a lot of podcasts, so that I was already doing that. Uh, but at the time, our marketing department came to me and said, hey, Greg, we really would like you to do a podcast on claims. And at the time, I think they were wanting more like stories of injured workers. And, and we've done a few of those. Um, but like those are harder to do in that we have to have a release from the injured worker and they have to be comfortable sharing it and they have to be unrepresented. So there's a lot of things that have to line up. Um, but I said, I do think there's a place for this and, um, and I'm willing to do it. Uh, and then from there, thinking about, well, what do we name it? And we actually uh, had the entire company just submit names and we put them all through. And so the name adjusted actually came from another intern that was a business engagement person. So, you know, I, I'm really big about empowering people to come up with ideas to make things work. Um, I don't assume I have all the answers. We've got the, the person who does the blog for our podcast as a, a manager out in Las Vegas who really likes podcasts. And she's like, hey, I'd love to, to do the blog part. 
Uh, so I think it's just, it's been a fun ride. We've really tried to keep the mindset of the podcast around what's moving the needle, what's making a difference, um, you know, and, and who are the people who are challenging the status quo? Because um, if we do things the way that they've always been done, then we're we're really going to fall into the same traps that we've been in. And there's always some risk to trying something new, but uh, there's also a lot of, I, th- I think it's more fun, I guess, to try something new and, and see where it goes. Totally. And, and I think it's a way to, to reach a different audience um, even if it's one or two people um, who may have a misperception of workers' compensation or, or what it's like. I, I, I'll be honest, it was the height of COVID and I was just too isolated. So I, can, <laughs> I wanted to talk to people uh, right, right. and engage with people. And I, I pitched it to, uh, to our amazing marketing crew and, and they said, yeah, absolutely. If you want to, if you want to host it. Let, let, let's go for it. But um, for me too, you know, we're, we're at Amitros and we serve injured individuals post-settlement and some of the stories, um, you know, every uh, sort of our tag is that every inj- injured individual has a story that deserves to be told. Um, and they're, they're really moving. And unfortunately in our, in our industry, and I think there's been a lot of good organizations like Comp Laude and, um, uh, and things like that, who have shined a light on them, and, and even Kids Chance that that I'm oh, a yeah. part of, talk about scholarships for for deserving folks. Um, oh yeah, you know I I think their injured individuals stories are often underrepresented in in the conversation of workers' compensation. So I mean, f- kudos to you for for bringing them into the fold. That that was our our primary drivers. Is you know, hey, let's. Let's tell an injured individual stories, and let's also talk to people like yourself who are working to make a difference uh, in in their lives. I, I think it. We keep coming back to this word empathy, and and, I, and, and it comes up so much um, on on all the episodes I have with folks who are in um, in the workers' compensation space trying to help people. But it also comes up on the injured individual side. Um, you can tell when folks have injured individuals have a good claims experience, even if it was a catastrophic injury, life-changing injury, if they have a good experience, it came back to people who cared about them on, on the claim side. Um, and, and I think we have to keep promoting that. If, if not, um, you know, we're looking at, at a, a pretty big um, exodus, I think, because of folks um, phasing out. And, and I'm, I'm very interested in your thoughts on what we can do to fill in the attrition of folks we're going to lose with a lot of institutional technical knowledge. Um, because I think initially the answer was technology. Like we're going to bring in technology. Right, right, right. You hit the nail on the head. Great. We're going to be able to crunch numbers, enter data, aggregate data, present data, and and streamline some some maybe, um, for lack of a better word, boring and mechanical processes. But you're not going to be able to empathetically engage and build a relationship with someone with technology. So um, I don't know. I just I'd love to get your thoughts on the the sort of the next generation of of work comp folks coming in and what we can do. I think you hit on some important things, and I think one of them is we also make, need to make sure that um, that they're in environments where we're constantly working with them, growing them, that we have leaders who know how to lead. I think you know um, that makes a big difference. Uh, I can think of you know of my time as a frontline employee, and very few times did I have a manager that had regular one on ones with me regular set aside and it's because they were too busy they had too much stuff going on but you really can't afford not to be doing that um because again it goes back to relationships so if you want to retain your people then you need to be available and you need to be listening to them and you need to know what their career path is and then you need to be giving them experiences so that they can grow and if you're not giving them those things they're going to go somewhere else to go find those things and so and I think there's also a big part of being heard 
Um, you know, I, I joke early in my career, I always felt like I was N0140409, which is my employee number, uh, which was great. I mean, you gotta log in somehow, but, uh, I think, you know, I, sometimes it's hard and sometimes we try to keep it so it's impersonal, so it will make tough decisions easier, but that's not what keeps people places. Um, you know, I had a adjuster I was talking to when we were in Baltimore at Claims College and she was talking about her manager who wasn't there. Um, but she said, you know what I love about Pete is when my daughter was having health issues, he would call me every day and just check in on me and ask me how I was doing and told me, you know what, don't worry about your claims. I've got this. I'll make sure you're taken care of. And she said, you know, I would run through a brick wall for him yeah. because he was there when I needed him. And I, he, and I knew he genuinely cared and those things you can't fake. So I think, if we want to retain our people, we want to bring up the next generation. We need to, when we think about empathy, we also need to think about, are we building those relationships of trust within our department? Uh, are we taking time to engage the people we work with? A um, couple examples of things I've done. One, just yesterday, uh, you know, with Cinco de Mayo. At, and so worked, I think they brought in chips and salsa and whatever. And, you know, so during lunch though, I grabbed like four or five people and we played a really short 20 minute roll and write a uh, little board game over lunch and yeah. everybody was laughing and having a good time. And it was, you know, somebody from marketing myself, a few adjusters an intern. Uh, and so I think, you know, we've got to do those little things that break down some of those barriers. Uh, if we want people to stay, we want them to, if we want them to feel like they're part of something. Uh, another example, when I first came to Berkeley industrial comp, one of the complicated, fun processes that I'm sure some other carriers have had to deal with is when the mail gets scanned in, some, some, a lot of times it can be indexed to the files, but sometimes they can't match it. So there'll be like a no match bin where there's medical records and bills and all the stuff that's got to find a home. And it's a manual job to find that and attach it. Well, we had been short staffed, so there was very few, there was a huge amount of mail that was hanging out there uh, that had been done. And so I asked at the time them to teach me how to do it. And we had all the managers learn how to do it. And then we ordered pizza for the next few days. And everybody, it didn't matter if they were the VP or if they were a manager, we all just did it together. Ate pizza and indexed. And we got all the way caught up. So I think we've got to do some of those things where, um, you know, we, we're not afraid to show people that we can do what they're doing, that we'll walk with them, that we'll yeah. listen, that we'll roll some dice at lunch or whatever it is, spend time with people. Um, those things are, I think, what ultimately keeps people. And of course, you've got to pay competitively. If you don't, then um, in this market, you're going to lose people. What do you think on, sort of along those lines about um, giving folks the opportunity to explore other um, areas of the comp business you know, let, letting a claims examiner sit with someone from underwriting or vice versa, or, and, and cause learning and development, L and D seems to be a really catchy phrase. I, I, I truly believe in it. Uh, but, but you have to live it and, and you have to make a, a place and a space for people to sort of explore and figure things out that they have no idea what they're doing and allow them to make some mistakes. Um, because if you're not, if, if folks are just stagnant in, in one role, I think it's sort of human nature to, to get burnt out a little bit. And, and there's some of us who are built differently who can just sit there and do the same thing over and over again. Um, but, you know, I don't know, what are your thoughts on um, sort of letting people branch out and, and sort of promoting this continual learning type of philosophy? I think it's really big. Um, I'm a big, big proponent of, of being able to zoom in and zoom out. Like you, if you can see the big picture, then the, then when you zoom back in on your individual tasks, then you understand that what's moving the needle. But if you don't understand how what you're doing is interconnected to everything else, then you're making decisions in a vacuum or you're making decisions because the guidelines say I have to make, make this decision or because my boss told me to or I'll get audited and I'll get in trouble. But if I'm making that decision because I understand if I make this decision, it's going to impact 
underwriting over here and it's going to impact new business over there and it's going to impact uh, the actual outcome in the claim I'm handling. If I can understand how they all interconnect, then that's when the really cool stuff can happen. And so I think it, it is not only the right thing to do for employees to give them those experiences. Um, and, I, and I think we should be having those conversations with our, with our staff of what are your goals? What do you want to see? What do you want to learn? And then we need to, to be able to, to give them those experiences. We have somebody in our business engagement team right now who's really interested in claims. He has 10 med only claims. OK, so that's not his job right now, but he's got 10 med only claims and he's working, you know, a couple times a day with our trainer. who's just showing him how to do those 10 med only claims, how to pay a bill, how to make a call to an employer. And so this is going to give him some exposure. He's not in claims right now, uh, but it's also going to make him a better candidate for us yeah. when we're, if, if, if we need a claims person. So all of those things go together. We've got another person in business engagement that really is interested in marketing. So we're trying to get her some exposure to that. Um, so I think we can do a better job of that. And I think when we do, it will really help people see the bigger picture. And I'm really lucky in that I'm in a company that's not very siloed. Uh, so it's easy to do that. I think I went probably 10 years and never talked to an underwriter as a adjuster. So, yeah. you know, I didn't even know how what I was doing was impacting anything else. Um, so you know, obviously I tried to do the best that I knew how based on what my manager told me, but I didn't see the big picture. And I think there's a lot of value in understanding how things interconnect. Yeah. So back to your, back to your podcast, what, what are, and you've done probably double or triple the episodes um, <laughs> I have. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a novice compared to you, but what are some of your more memorable episodes or guests that you've had or, or things that were you walked away from and like, wow, this is really cool that I get to do this. Yeah, there's been several. Um, you know, Timothy Alexander is a, uh, a hero in my book. I've met him in person before. Um, now, he wasn't injured in a work comp injury, but he was, he's a paraplegic now. And hearing his story and his mindset and how much he talks about mindset and really now what he does is he works with college athletes at UAB, University of Alabama, Birmingham, uh, on the football team to, you know, work, work on their um, mental development, their mindset. And he's there every day. So to see somebody who he was the first ever uh, collegiate athlete that's a paraplegic to, re to receive a scholarship. UAB actually gave him, him an athletic scholarship for the football wow. team. And he showed up and they said, like, athletes on the field, and he rolled out there in his wheelchair. And just that mindset of, like, I can do it and I am going to try, um, I think really inspires me. Uh, so that one, to me, was pretty special. Um, I'm always interested in the companies that are doing things that are pushing boundaries. Uh, we've got one that will be airing soon with Plethi that's doing um, using uh, like basically little discs that you stick on, like stickers that you stick yeah. on your arm. And then when you're doing your home exercises, they can monitor if you're doing them right, how many to do. And then there's an app on your phone and you can track it. And you can track your mood and all of those types of things, which I think is great because I had uh, I hurt my shoulder at one point and they gave me some therapy and things and. I know I should have been doing them, but I'll be honest, I didn't always do those home exercises. So maybe if I'd had an app that was like reminding me, hey, Greg, it's time to do your TheraBand exercises, that would have helped me. Um, I think it's just human nature. So I'm excited to see what that could do, where we start to find ways to integrate. I think we've got the, um, the do-it-yourself model when you're released from the hospital and the do-it-for-you model, which is you know, when you're in the hospital, you've got a catheter, somebody's taking your trash out, someone's bringing you food. And we haven't done a good job in the health industry of finding the do it with you model. Yeah. So we've had guests like Plethi, we've guests like uh, Becky Curtis at Take Courage that does pain coaching. I think there's a real need for people in the space to do the do it with you model. And I'm always interested in the people who are trying to do that, whether it's the VR technology for pain, we did one on that. Uh, all of the people who are doing kind of the coaching uh, that are helping people through the process. I think we're not great at that right now. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So do we both, and I may have this wrong, do we both have kids in fifth grade? Let's see. Let me go through them. 
Yes, I have a fifth grader who will be a sixth grader. Yes, my okay. son, uh, Liam. All right. So if you and I, because my daughter's in fifth grade, so if we were to walk in, if our kids were in the same class, we went into a fifth grade class, both two, two dudes in comp. What, yep. what are what's our pitch? What what's our 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 elevator pitch to to our kids, <laughs> fifth graders to say, this is where you want to be. When, 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 when you, when you graduate high school or you go to college and you come out and you're ready to enter the workforce, you're going to be in work comp. Yeah. What do we tell them? Cause I'm, I'm going to point to you and go, let's, let's listen. Uh, to your handling. Well, I would say, first of all, I've never had a dull day in my entire career. I'm always solving problems and I like to solve problems. So yeah, I've, I've never seen the same thing twice. Um, so if you're the type of person who likes variety, likes to be able to do lots of different things, um, see different things, solve problems and help people. This is a career for you. So that's what I would say. And I'd probably tell some fun story about an injured worker. So, um, just to kind of pique their interests of the types of injuries we see and, and how we help people. Well, on that, I think maybe someday we will go to, uh, to a school and give them the pitch. Uh, cause I, fun. I, think, I think it's important. Um, <clears throat> I, I, um, I remember being a kid and there, there would be at least a couple parents every year that would come in and I never saw someone in the insurance field. It was always, a, <laughs> and, and don't get me wrong, like having a police officer or a doctor or a lawyer is, is great. And, and those are great uh, careers to aspire, but um, knowing how dynamic and interesting and how impactful um, we can be in this industry, you know, I, I do want to spread the good word. Uh, and I appreciate you for the work that you're doing uh, to do that. So it's settled. We had we had Greg Hamlin on and appreciate it very much. Thank you, Sean. I've had a great time. Uh, look forward to uh, running into you at a conference one of these days. Yeah, I would love to have you back on too. Or, or I'm even willing to be on yours too someday if if you are uh, if you're really searching for for someone. To be on, <laughs> well, we'll get you on there. We'll get you on there. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks Greg. Doug. Thanks for joining us for this episode of It's Settled, the Amitros podcast. For more information and episodes, you can visit us at our website at amitros.com. That's A-M-E-T-R-O-S dot com. Or head over to iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. We hope you enjoyed this episode and look forward to sharing more stories of people overcoming their workplace accidents and bodily injury claims and those who are working hard to make a difference for them. So it's settled. We'll see you next time. <music>